Merry Christmas, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, welcome to the Life Church. We're so glad that you're with us today. Uh, if this is your first time and you're visiting today, please fill out um, a visitor form located on the back table or ask one of the ushers for one. You can uh, drop them in the donation, donation baskets that are also located on the back tables before you leave today. Um, all right, it's announcement time, but first of all, um, we would like to extend a really warm welcome to Dick and his wife, Donna Williams, who will be our guest speakers today. Yes, thank you. All right, guys, it is Nativity Sunday. I believe the last Nativity we had was actually 2018. Is that correct? So it's been like three years. So this is a very special event. Um, caroling with the Wood River High School, uh, Cole Voce. Oh, thank you. Calavoce. Oh, Calavoce. Groups uh, start at 4.30 and Nativity program begins at 5 p.m. Please show up. This will be an amazing, amazing thing to go to. Everyone who is participating in the Nativity in any way, please park in the southwest lot by the white van until it is full and then park in the northeast parking lot as far away as possible to allow visitors to use the main parking lot. Unless you are a senior, then you want to use the nearest parking by the kitchen doors right over there. And we are looking for helpers after the nativity for cleanup and to remove all the straw hay bales. Uh, prayer meetings, Tuesdays at 10 a.m., Wednesdays at 6.15, both in the same prayer room. Uh, men's group, Tuesdays at 5 a.m. at the church. Uh, and youth group is breaking for the holidays. We will resume Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. on January 5th. All ages from 7th grade, save the date for winter youth, youth camp for all middle and high schoolers on February 4th through 6th in McCall. Uh, we will be leaving the Life Church on February 4th at 11.30 a.m. to join Life Church from Boise uh, for a life-impacting weekend together. Uh, see Reese Moore for more information. Reese, are you here? Can you wave your hand? Okay, he's not here. Anyways, uh, <laughs> all right, Senior Connection. Uh, the Senior Connection is distributing gro grocery gift cards to their members for this holiday season. If anyone wants to donate a grocery gift card in any amount, um, you can drop them off here at the church or at the Senior Connection. All donations are appreciated. Uh, we have a special treat this Friday, December the 24th, Christmas Eve. We're actually doing a Christmas Eve candlelit service with caroling, musical specials, Advent reading, communion, and the Christmas story. Please come, bring your family, bring your friends. This will be a very nice way to just ring in Christmas. All right. Oh, and then Sunday, December 26th, the day after Christmas, there's going to be no service. Just enjoy the time with your families. All right, upcoming Bible studies. Women's Bible study Wednesdays at 6 p.m. beginning January 5th, going through Joyce Meyer's best-selling book, Battlefield of the Mind. These meetings will take place at Ashley Olson or Marissa's house, switching back and forth for the duration of the study. Both homes are in Bellevue, so uh, please go chat with either of these ladies if you're interested in, or have any questions. And Ashley and Marissa, if you want to wave your hands so we can know where you are. Boom, boom, right there and there. Thank you. And then another women's Bible study on um, Mondays at 6 p.m. starting on January 10th at the church, studying the book of Galatians with Mel. Mel, wave your hand right there. Woohoo! And then men's Bible studies on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in the church prayer room, studying the book of Acts with Phil. Phil, if you're here, raise your hand. Boom, right there. Perfect. All right, a couple more announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you who uh, donated to the winter clothing donation. We were actually able to get a substantial amount of clothes that were able to go out to families in need in the community. So we appreciate your donations. Um, and our outreach ministry has actually found a few families in our community who are in need this holiday season. Now, if you are interested in helping out to bless these families in any way, please, after church, come talk to Rob and Charlie Cronin. Raise your hand right there. Randy, raise your hand right there. Or myself, um, and we can uh, kind of show you what we're needing to help these families. Uh, donations. For any offerings you'd like to donate this week, there is a basket on the back table that you can drop your offerings into, and you can give via the church app or website, lifechurchinvalley.org. Um, just a reminder, this is the last Sunday of the year we are taking an offering. If you have donations to give between now and the end of the year that you would like applied to your 2021 tax receipt, you can still give via the church app or website or mail-in donations. Envelopes must be postmarked by December 35th. 35th, wow. December, th this is, uh, there's so many announcements. December 31st. All right, and lastly, Children's Church is happening today. Four-year-olds through sixth grade, 
Kids can head into the back room. Adam, raise your hand. Adam's at the back door. He's going to lead your kids. And that's all the announcements. Thank you. Amen. Before Brother Dick comes up uh, this morning uh, to minister to us, um, uh, so many of you have given your time and your effort and, 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 and put so much into the nativity. And we want to thank each and every one of our volunteers uh, for stepping up and making this thing incredible this year. We're, how many of you are just excited about tonight? I'm excited about the community coming in and just, you know, just being able to see really that's the reason. Jesus is the reason, right? Why we celebrate this time of year. And it's so important. Um, so we want to ask Vanessa Gibbs to come up here and Rebecca, Rebecca Cox. We want to honor these two. The Bible says give honor where honor is due. And they have put so much time and effort and planning into this thing. I heard uh, Vanessa had a major meltdown the other day. And, and, and <laughs> you at least have to have one, right? Uh, but uh, we just so appreciate your... You guys are so far over there. Come on. So I can see in here. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for everything that you've done in the planning of this. It's, it's really been smooth, and we're just expecting just an incredible night tonight. But thank you so much. Uh, uh, we've been praying for this and praying that it would touch our community. And so let's give it up for Vanessa and Rebecca. Thank you. Good job, girls. All right. Uh, at, at this time, uh, I did want to tell you, too, if you have a special offering for Dick and Donna, uh, there are ministers this morning, uh, please mark it in an envelope. There are envelopes back in the back, and just put those in the donation baskets back in the, they're on both of the tables back in the back on your way out. And we just want to thank you for being here with us. And remember, we don't have service next Sunday at all, but we do have the Friday night Christmas Eve service, and we're really going to have a special time. It's going to be awesome. I've heard some of the songs and different things that they're going to do. It's going to be great. The communion will be uh, always an intimate time, and, and uh, that starts at 7 o'clock on that Christmas Eve. Uh, we're blessed to have Dick and Donna here with us this morning, and, and uh, they both go together. How many of you know that? They, uh, Dick does uh, the majority of the ministry stuff, and, and uh, Dick, we just love your heart. We love both of you. You're friends of this ministry. Uh, they're just right over in Boise, but they go all over the West Coast and different areas, and uh, Dick is our hero. You know, he's going on 82, and uh, he's just, he's going strong. Uh, so, Dick, thank you so much for being with us this morning. We love you. Thank you so much, Mike. We're so glad to be here. This is one of the primetime highlights. For one reason, we just learned to love Mike and Carola and this church in the marvelous way that it lifts up the fiery torch of the gospel as a beacon in this area. And also because it's usually our last glory gig of the year and we get about 20 days off. Do you need to plug in? Oh, I need to plug in. Mike reminded me. Uh, you know, I, I have trouble functioning in the realm of the spirit and the practical at the same time. I <laughs> asked my wife. She's, a de she's the anointed detailed person. I'm the visionary. And there's a fine line between being a visionary and a space cadet. <laughs> My mind still really works well. I forget where I park my car once in a while, but I did that when I was 25. Oh, Lord, we just celebrate you. 
Oh, holy night The stars were brightly shining Tis the night of our dear Savior's birth Long lay the world in sin and error pining Then he appeared And the soul found its words There's the chord I was looking for A thrill of hope A weary world rejoices A yonder breaks a new and glorious morn All on your knees Hear the angel voices O oh, night divine O oh, night when Christ was born Oh, night divine Oh, night Oh, night divine You know, when I went out this morning to warm up my car for my wife and saw blue skies. It was a delightful sight. These inversion layers, we have them in voices, they kind of clamp down the cold. It's amazing that sights and scenes will evoke memories of particular songs. I remember a song by Brother Barry McGuire. It's a happy day, and I praise God for the weather. Mm, it's a happy day, I'm living it for my Lord. Well, it's a happy day, and things are going to get better. Oh, living each day by the promises in God's Word. I met Barry when I was a new Christian and I was a waiter at a folk music house near the UCLA campus where I was a student. And he used to appear there once in a while with the new Christian minstrels. And he was this body, loud mouth, bullysome kind of a guy that people gave a wide swath to. And when I heard later on that he got saved, I was amazed. And further amazed when I got to do the opener for him in a joint concert at Camp Cedarcrest up in the San Bernardino Mountains back in the day. And Donna and I had a chance to sit down with Barry and his wife, Maury, to just get to know one another since we were gonna tag team that evening. And I was amazed at the transformation. He was still this broad-shouldered, barrel-chested of a guy, not especially tall, probably around six foot. And he began to share his testimony, and he began to just weep and sob incontrollably at the goodness of the Lord. I thought, amazing grace. God reaches down into those that polite society considers marginal. Homeless people that are written off as derelicts foraging around for change to get their next bottle of Thunderbird. And I realize some of you squeaky clean folks don't know what that is, but I know what it is. It's kind of high-powered wine on steroids. But he also reaches for the up-and-outers, too, and invades their ivory towers just long enough to let them know that there is a much higher pedestal, the throne of heaven and the king of heaven, 
that invades them when they realize that irrespective of their fame, how empty they are on the inside. I've heard two different accounts from reliable sources of the conversion of John Wayne just prior to his passing, passing over into glory, actually. And I've got all the Duke's movies in my DVD collection, starting with Stagecoach, Fort Apache, and on into She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, and beyond that into Rio Bravo, and then uh, Rooster Cogborn, and the sequel to that. And then what I thought was his best work, his last movie, The Shootist, that he did with Lauren Bacall and young Ron Howard at that time. Did an amazing job. But as it turns out, Robert Schuller, who was uh, sort of a friend of the Duke, uh, Dr. Schuller's daughter had had a motorcycle injury. And resultingly, it had to become an amputee. And John Wayne was so impressed with just her fortitude and principalized character that he had a friend that was visiting Schuller's daughter and sent a note to her of encouragement and what an inspiration she was to him. And he wrote a note back to him and used the same delivery service of the friend in common. And it said essentially, Mr. Wayne, I've always enjoyed your work on the silver screen, but would love to think of heaven as a place where I'm going to see you along with myself. And it occurred in a restaurant, and they were seated around a joining of tables, and John Wayne, known as the Duke by nickname, was seated at one end, and his friend who had delivered the letter was seated at the other. And his friend suddenly remembered that in his breast pocket of his coat, he had the letter addressed to the Duke. And he said, Duke, got a special note from Dr. Shooter's daughter. And he passed it around the table, and John Wayne read it aloud. And at the end, with tears streaming down his leather-wrinkled cheeks, he said, I want you to know that I'm making Jesus Christ Lord of my life. So among many others, when we get on the other side of glory, at our passing or the day of the Lord, we're going to see John Wayne on the other side of glory. And that'll be the day. <laughs> you know, you're getting a little long in years when all the people you impersonate have passed on. <laughs> also do Johnny Cash and... Elvis and Martin and Lewis, but hey, those are other messages. Count your blessings. <laughs> yeah. As for me, I remember it was 1963, and I was a student at the University of California, Los Angeles, better known as UCLA, a very secular campus. And I was there from an upper middle class family at a highly rated university, seeming to have all of the advantages but a deep, dark, empty hole in my spirit. Dark, stillborn in sin, and that's the way we're all born into this world. With that deep, dark hole, the great French Scientist Blaise Pascal called it man is born with a God-shaped vacuum inside that can only be satisfied through a relationship with God on the basis of his son, Jesus Christ. I couldn't identify it back then until I heard that quote from Dr. Pascal to a friend of mine that was 95% zeal and 5% wisdom, but hey, between the lines of bravado, I heard the gospel anyway. And that was one of the things that Dennis quoted to me. And it struck a nerve of need in my being. Here I was seemingly having all of the advantages naturally, and yet feeling 
a bent and even a momentum toward being suicidal. And in retrospect, I began to contemplate that God-shaped vacuum in later years as I would occasionally teach on it. And basically what it was and is, is man is born with a deep inner craving for intimacy. That's up close and personal union of the heart based on love and trust with the ability to be totally transparent. It's a quartet of needs, not only intimacy, but identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of value. And not only a sense of intimacy and identity, but resultingly a sense of dominion, an empowerment and an ability to contend and contest adversity, and to be assured that as we hang in there, we're gonna come out on the other side victorious. We live on a fallen planet that's replete with ambushes, and encounters and major battles with the evil one and a world system that operates on the seduction of false promises and drives people stressfully to use one another to acquire possessions and positions. A need for intimacy, identity, dominion and destiny, a sense of divinely divined purpose, finding our niche, that collection of aptitudes and gifts that are in us coming together, that give us a passion and an equipping to know him and make him known in ever increasing measure. And when it's our time to depart, to leave a positive handprint behind us, having been cultivated as a glove on his hand. And it's a process. Coming into the fulfillment of all of those things, it's a process, and it's the quadrifold inheritance that we enjoy with Jesus. John 16, 13 says the Holy Spirit will speak of him and frame him in glory. And Jesus said he will take of mine my inheritance as the supreme son, the all-conquering one, and he will reveal it to you and begin to progressively lead you into the reality of the experience of that as you increasingly begin to experience and express heaven on earth until the time you see it in all of its unveiled grandeur no longer masked by history's haze. But in meanwhile, we can grow in the knowing of life, eternal life, which isn't just uninterrupted longevity, but a certain quality of love, order, power, purity, health, and abundance. Ah, oh, it will come through our valleys of lack, but we recognize we've tasted and there's no turning back. Lord, continue me to lead me along and step with your son. Hallelujah. So important to have those quality times with the Lord to be recentered in our mentor and what he exemplified in the Gospels. He now, in his resurrection, enables us and trains us to reign in the art of the heart 
of living in moment by moment dependence on his dynamic and it becoming a demonstration in our lives because we learn early on the Christian life isn't hard, it's impossible, only one man ever lived it, but when he becomes resident in us, he is replicated in us and we rely on the reality of Christ within and growingly mirror the majesty, power, and purity that is him. That's the high calling of Jesus Christ. So important early on to seek and have our spirit minister to. Our spirit is the full replication of the image of King Jesus Christ created in righteousness, holiness of the truth. That's Ephesians 4.24. It can't be defiled, can be neglected, and it needs to feast on the substance of the word, needs to inhale the breath of his presence, and needs to be flexed in worship. And as we do, our heart, that's the depths of desire, comes to where our treasure is and functions in sync, and the very life of the Lord, the life of the Spirit, begins to give transfusions into our soul. That's our personality, the unique chemistry of how we think, feel, and choose our mind, will, and emotions, which at the time of regeneration, of his replication in our spirit, our soul usually resembles something of a train wreck in a soap opera. But God wants to bring it into a place of prospering health and to the degree that it does, we become the conduit and lampstand of his life flow through us. David said, early in the morning will I seek thee. An old Montana cowboy would say it like this. Another brisk Montana morning, golden glimmer has me blinking. Rising now, I hear me creaking. Down the hall I toil. To the place I meet with Jesus, feed the empty stove and arm load. Soon the room is bright with warm glow. Coffee pot is dancing to a boil. Divine appointment, ha ah, his name is just like ointment. Rubs it into my needy soul, I'm worshiping my God. On my fire, the master's breathing. Consuming all my fear and grieving, inner fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Out my window there I gaze, scan the morning's golden haze. Two deer bolt across the yard, the Lord renews my youth. My spirit leaps and runs with Jesus through the meadows of his kingdom. Brightness of his fragrant freedom, grazing on the greatness of his truth. Divine appointment, you know his name is just like ointment. Well, he rubs it into my needy soul, I'm worshiping my God. On my fire, the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving. Bitter fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Beside myself with holy joy, I'm dancing like a little boy, just high-stepping through that room, arthritis be gone, gliding in his grace, safety in the arms of his grace, kingdom joy has filled the place, laughing in his presence now, Laughing yet with sweet tears of release. Divine appointment, his name is just like ointment. When he rubs it into my needy soul, I'm worshiping my God. On my fire, the master's breathing, consuming all my fear and grieving. Then her fire is rising as he stokes it with his rod. Then her fire is rising as he stoops with his rod. Jesus, the personification of the perfection of intimacy, identity, 
dominion, and destiny. That's his inheritance as the all-conquering resurrected one. And through rebirth, we've been brought into the position by the grace of his perfect performance into the place of family as being joint heirs. In our spirit, we're royalty. Hallelujah. In our soul, we're still earthenware. But as we're cultivated through regular transfusions of inner healing and being released from religious stereotype characters of God to the unveiling of his true goodness and patriarchal high ambition for each of us to excel. Written in Psalm 35, 27, magnify the Lord who delights in the prosperity of his servant. The prayer in 3 John, one chapter, verse 2, I would above all that you be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. We grow into this development and demonstration, experience, and expression of intimacy, identity, dominion, and destiny. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, leads us into the reality of that as an experience and expression and the terra firma of practicality, and he brings those things to remembrance when we need a little bit of postgraduate work in something that has slipped our mind. Glory. John 17, verse 3, sums up the definition of eternal life better than anyone, as Jesus put it. He's praying his great classic intercessory prayer for his disciples and those disciples to come through the generations to yet pass as he says and this is eternal life that they might know you father and Jesus Christ whom you have sent the word for know there is the word for physical intimacy in the covenant of marriage it is an intercoursing of hearts we're already one in our spirit but as our spirit is fed our heart begins to come to where our treasure is and there is this oneness of the cadence of his heartbeat and the depths of his desire for us becomes the depths of our desire toward him it needs to be renewed on a daily basis we begin to experience life in a heavenly dimension in the here and now. He further goes on to say, John 15, 5, I am the branch and you are the branches. He who abides in me, who cultivates that intercoursing of the heart, that oneness, that union in our depths, and partakes of the buoyancy, force, and flow of his very life in us and through us, will bear fruit. Some people say, well, that's the fruit of soul winning. Some say it's the fruit of character. You might say, which is it? Yes. I get tired of people taking complementary truths and making them conflicting truths. It's the life lived through us, and we impact others by the fruit of love, joy, peace, and patience as those things are transmitted from us. I've had some exemplary people that I've impacted by, but it also produces the works of charitable servanthood and also the dynamics of exploits, of signs and wonders. We were at an Andrew Womack conference uh, about three years ago and saw a baby raised from the dead. This frantic mom brings this lifeless little child up to the platform while ministry is going on. They stop what they're doing. And uh, Carly Terrazda, this little gal, five foot nothing, but a dynamo of lightning, races over, lays hands on that child. And she doesn't plead before, God, please help this baby to live. 
She says, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of God, in the power of the Lord, resident in me by his grace, I command life to come into those lungs. And that little baby began to breathe rhythmically and was just sleeping peacefully on the edge of that platform. And the grateful mom was weeping and laughing. And there was this ovation. And there were probably a thousand recorded healings physically that happened at that time. We've seen a great deal of it ourselves. The very first time that I was asked to be a narrator at this nativity event, our kids were just laid out with the flu. I mean, that was back when the flu was the flu and they called it the flu. <laughs> no need to take that any further. And that Friday morning when we were headed up toward Haley, I had this raging fever. My body was aching. And I thought, by his stripes I have been healed. I am laying hold of the finished work. And I began to, with my hoarse voice that might have had a five-octave, five, uh, five, five octave, five-note range, I began to declare and confess the truth that had been a revelation in my heart. It wasn't just mental gymnastics with trained tonsils, spewing it out. All that does is underscore symptoms. You get that revelation of the finished work, of the availability of grace that's been set into force, the very favor of God, and we learn to appropriate it. And what is in our heart by revelation, make it declaration Life and death are truly in the power of the tongue. And we need to have it plugged in to the right force. And I was still sick as a dog, as the old southern proverb goes. I think you still see, see it and hear it. And we got here and I was still sick. And yeah, I was taking the Theraflu and the stuff to calm the symptoms, but I went to sleep that night and I could sense the spirit activating my immune system in a battle. I hardly slept at all. But when I did wake up from my shallow sleep that morning, the symptoms were gone. And I thought, have I still got a voice? I got in the shower and my acid test is singing the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> and I did. I just hope the people in the room next to us were patriotic. <laughs> I went out and I had my full voice ready and had this complete absence of symptoms. And I don't win every bout, but I win much more when I have come to the resolve that God does not lay sickness on us. He is a good and perfect God. Every gift comes from above. I don't conceive false theologies based on my symptoms to defend God and let myself off the hook, but lay hold on the fact that Calvary's act has provided for healing. And I'm battling something right now that I've been battling for a long time, a numbness in my legs, but I continue to declare it, and I have seen breakthroughs enough to continue to declare it, and I'll keep on keeping on. Amen. It hit me, the fall, and a spinal trauma when I was age 74. And up to that time, I'd been training for years in martial arts, both stateside and in South Korea, where I was stationed with the United States Army. And I made sure there was no Eastern mysticism in the place to where I was doing it. If you enrolled your kids in those things, make sure you talk with whoever the master is, because you can sense those kind of things. You can sense a gentleman that first and foremost teaches your kids to walk away from a fight. Action Jackson, my grandson, loves the Lord. He is spirit-filled, loves the souls of people. He is lovingly bold. But if a riot ever broke out where he was, I would want him right next to me because... He has been an avid student of Krav Maka, 
and if need be, is a killing machine, and yet a lover of the souls of people loves Jesus. He'd be there to defend weaker people. So I've still got this feeling, these symptoms that I continue to stand against, but in my corner where my workout place is, and I work out with bands, I don't use dumbbells anymore, the bands are kinder to my joints. I'm at my army weight of 165 pounds. But leaning up against that wall there is a board that I used to break with a spin kick. That's that Chuck Norris wheel kick where you look at it, and you kind of glare it down, <laughs> and you, hi, you give it down, and come back around with the back of your foot and spin around and nail that thing. I used to do that routinely. And I said, I see myself with the eyes of hope breaking that thing and in the climate of hope and the vision thereof of what yet hasn't occurred yet in the natural faith forms and becomes substance. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And if your theology differed from mine on that, I won't let it divide us. <laughs> I just know since I've come to that conclusion, I see a lot more healing than I used to. Praise the name of the Lord. John 15, 5. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit the fruit of character, the fruit of action, the fruit of servanthood, the fruit of exploits. I was talking with Ernie Cotta, pastor friend in Visalia, California, and Ernie was getting a, a, a hip transplant. And when he came out of the sedation, they gave him a narcotic, a painkiller, and he'd never had one in his life. And he didn't know that. Here he is, 72 Never had had a pharmaceutical in his life. If you're taking them, don't feel condemned because they, you know, they can have their place for a season. But um, all of a sudden, his blood pressure plunged and the lines on the machinery flatlined and the hospital staff shook their heads with tragedy. Ernie's wife, Charlotte, was there. She's also a little five foot nothing with a little small voice. And Ernie said, I could feel my spirit leaving my body and approaching this spectrum of light that was indescribably beautiful, but I could hear my wife raising her voice in the background, Ernie Carter, in the name of Jesus, you come back down and get into your body. You're not leaving me alone to pastor this church. And he said, it was like magnetism. I could feel my spirit going back down in my body. He said, I woke up and where they had nodded their heads in tragedy before. The staff was scared spitless at what they saw. <laughs> Our God reigns. Right. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. I can remember of coming into that marvelous union with him and sensing the revolution in my spirit and the night watches became a time of transfusions in my soul getting healed of rejection getting healed of religious caricatures and deception and the Lord would send waves of healing into my soul in retrospect I wrote this song Sometimes in the night watch of my room On my back I lie and stare at my ceiling I see his cross of tear, crown of thorns in his hand And it melts my stubborn heart and sets me to kneeling. Then there's a glow that I feel 
was in my room Like a friendly fire One feels on a chilly day As over me he stands Soothes my wounds with nail-scarred hands Such a big, strong hand Once plied a carpenter's trade Then I say Lord, I want to be like you Like a little boy Wants to be like his father Says, child, follow me I'll show you things You never dreamed you'd see You see, I'm warm, I'm real You can give yourself to me Intimacy Up close and personal, transparent love and trust In the night watch of my room Identity, a sense of belonging The blood of Jesus says you are valuable You are worth it to the King of glory to the Father of lights to give the very best for you. The blood of Jesus declares you have forgiveness of sins, that you stand justified in righteousness through the perfect performance of the perfect one, and you are liberated from the vanity of a vain way of life of trying to perform to win his approval, which only stirs up the baser inclinations of the darkest sins, and we've got to be reminded of that when we would drift to the left or to the right and get our minds renewed with power steering to respond to the backseat driving of the Spirit when he says, according to Isaiah 30, 21, when you start to drift to the left or the right, you'll hear a voice behind you say, this is the way of the Lord walking in it. And what's that way? It's to reconnect with the momentum of his grace the force of his favor, the buoyancy, flavor, and force and favor of the life of the Lord in you, lived through you, which you learn to hitch a ride on. Sometimes we've got to take faith steps forward to intersect with that momentum of his life flow. I remember the first time during the Jesus movement, the Lord was calling me to do street evangelism and I was out there with a bunch of other people and I remember of walking over toward a group of hippie types and my knees smote one against the other <laughs> as King James put it and saying with halting speech my baby steps of faith look more like a spastic stagger than a confident walk Nonetheless, I was walking toward him, and I said with a shaky voice, a group of us, including myself, are here to share someone and something that changed our lives. If you got a minute, which you probably don't, I'm sure you got an important appointment elsewhere. I'd like to share it with you, and the kid closest to me says, I want to hear. And I began to stumble and stutter through a presentation of the gospel and begin to see that intersected by the fluidity and the solidity of God's grace in the very life of the Lord permeating my speech. And when I got to the punchline at the end, I said, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to receive Jesus Christ right now? And he said, no reason at all. I want to receive him. Shocked me out of my socks because I'd already breathed a sigh of relief. Well, Hey, I got out here and did it. That amazed me right there. And we prayed together. And he said, hey, give me some of those booklets. He didn't know to call them tracks. He didn't speak Christianese yet. <laughs> and he walked away handing those things out. How about that? A 
sense of identity, a sense of belonging. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. It's 1 Corinthians 6.20. You don't have to be the CEO in the center of your own little universe anymore. We can say, Lord, I turn myself over lock, stock, and barrel to you as silly, buddy, spendable currency, and I trust your spirit to operate, and I'm going to know as you do, and as I'm in the Word, I'm going to cooperate, and you're going to work in me both to will and to do your good pleasure. I'm turning myself over to the overcomer and to begin to be an overcomer of this fallen world system, and my walk is going to be in the rhythms of your grace, and I'm going to walk and hear the spirit of the serpent snap, crackle, and pop under my feet. Hallelujah. Because I'm more than a conqueror through the grace of him who loved me. I may have taken a beating the day before, but the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. I have dominion. I've got the power to endure through adversity. I'm going to come out on the other side with refined faith and character, more reliant on him than ever, and have my hope underscored that my good God is able to handle anything irrespective of momentary circumstantial lack, and I can declare with authority my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We had uh, about, about two and a half years ago, just a siege of financial budget biters that were huge, that were coming at us from every side. And the Lord said, hey, you got the ball on the two-yard line, your own two-yard line, you're going to go on the offensive, start sowing, start giving. And we did beyond what we'd been giving before, and finances began to come from the four winds all over the place. It was another life lesson in faith and coming through a trial and coming with refined faith. All facing my days surrounded by the blues mm, But I know for certain that I'm not going to lose As sooner or later Jesus turns it around for me and it's going to be soon Yo, to get where I'm going gotta walk through some rain Hey, but I know the sun is gonna shine bright again Sooner or later, he turns it around for me mm -hmm. Here in the furnace, it's burning my bonds away And it's forming in my soul Turning into gold Brighter and purer day by day Oh I hear his word, my faith rises high, got that aerial view, mm, I see deep and wide, sooner or later I see him turning around for me, gonna be soon, oh, here in the furnace, it's burning my bonds away, kind of like yodeling, iron is forming in my soul, Turning into gold, I learned that from Barry. Brighter and purer day by day. Some of you are old enough to know who and what I'm talking about. If you're not, it's okay. This chapter will end. Oh, but not the book. Soon I know I'm going to take a blessed backward look as I sweetly remember how he turned it around. For me, sweetly remember how he turned it around. Learn that chop from hanging out with the brothers. For me, yeah. Hallelujah. Identity. Intimacy. Up close and personal transparency based on love and trust. Coming into a union of hearts, partaking of his life. Identity, a sense of value, belonging. The blood of Christ is worth valuable. 
Our hearts cry according to Romans 8, 15, Abba, Father, Daddy, Lord. Dominion. Knowing that he's going to strengthen us with the dunamis, that's Greek, for power to endure with joy in the inevitable expectation that we're going to come out on the other side. We're just passing through. It may be a lengthy or a short season, but we're going to live to shout about it. And finally, destiny. As you turn yourself over to him, lock, stock, and barrel as a living sacrifice, and we do that daily because the living sacrifice keeps crawling off the altar. We renew that posture of the heart. We begin to see his will, which is good. It's benevolent. It's acceptable. That in the Greek, it is an aroma of sweet sacrifice. It's agreeable. And it's perfect. It's complete. All the I's are dotted and the T's crossed. And we can expect to be able to discern that as we're turned over to the overcomer and to resist the clamp of this mold trying to shape us in its image. And we begin to see our particular gift majors in the University of the Holy Spirit. They may be more public than others, but they're equally important. I have never seen my spleen, but hey, I'm so thankful I got one. It doesn't have public ministry, but it serves a purpose. My big joke when my grandkids used to shoot at me was, oh, my spleen. Papa, what's a spleen? I just have one grandchild, by the way. And he's a jewel. Destiny. Getting a piece of the action in these days. The kingdom of God was invasive on the day of Pentecost. It had already been moving across the land. The glory of God had already filled the place. But the Lord begins to open our eyes to see that the good guys far outnumber the bad guys two to one as the servant of Gehazi. Gehazi uh, was Elijah, Elisha's service. He was kicked back, knowing that the Syrians were outnumbered all over the place. And Gehazi is shaking in his sandals. And Elisha says, open up the boy's eyes. And the Lord would have us look between the lines of the socio-political upheaval we see going on. Because if all you do is OD on the news, you're going to vacillate between rage and panic. But you begin to see between the lines of God's kingdom movement. And you say, oh, Lord, you are Lord of my life. I want to be an anointed agent that extends your kingdom dimension because I know you want to see it permeate the planet. In his latter years, this was the signature song of Mr. John Raymond Cash, who was a patriot something of a patron saint of some of us deeper baritones that came to sing up there with the tenors without hurting ourselves. I'm going to move toward a close with this. The Lord's restoring his church to become a temple, a body, a farmy, a, a temple, a body, a family, an army, a bride. He's sculpting through the excesses and the deficits he's filling and cause it to become a kingdom extending agency. People are being trained to reign and identify and being mentored to walk moment by moment with the king and impart his very heart and mind as lampstands and conduits that begin to invade every area of secular society. Johnny, in his closing years, this was his signature song. Jesus was a carpenter. You know he worked with a saw and a hammer. And his hand could form a table true enough to stand forever. And he could have lived his life out 
in the little town of Nazareth when he laid aside his tools and he walked the burning highways as he built a house for folks like you and me built it with living stones like us and he found them as they wandered in the wild Judean mountains and he called them as they cast their nets on the sea of Galilee and for a thousand evenings as the days behind him ended he walked among the poor and he stopped to touch the dying as he built a house with folks like you and me. Oh, master builder, move again, Lord Jesus. Move as a carpenter among us. Men build chapels to their discontent, cathedrals to their sorrow. Many live in golden mansions with the sand for a foundation and the raging waters rising. Lord, the raging waters rising. Yet you build your house on rock once more today and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And whatever your eschatology, I believe Jesus gets his prophecies fulfilled. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed And all flesh shall see it together And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it I want to be a channel For the river of God I want to be a channel For the river of God So dig me deep, Lord and dig me wide I want to be a channel for the river of God May the nail-pierced hands of Jesus take the balm of Gilead and give you a healing soul massage unto encouragement and another installment of wholeness unto holiness as we manifest him and we're perfected in the art of the heart of leaning on him moment by moment and being conformed to him at soul level in attitude and action. That's the high calling of King Jesus Christ. Pastor Mike.